Uh, oh, well, let's go. Let's go over it, Lab. Yeah. Essentially, are you on Windows? Okay. Here's what you'd do. Uh, the question was, how do you zip up files if you're not sure? You'd do it like this. Let's say, let me download something. Let me download today's assignment, and or not today's assignment, but today's uh, example that we're going to start with, and I'll zip it up. It's already zipped up, but. I'll unzip it and then zip it up again. So. And is it the same for Mac? No. Oh, I got Windows. He got Mac. <laughs> yeah, it's it's similar. I can show you on a Mac in my laptop and lab. Perfect. Actually, I probably could show you here. Uh, we'll we'll do it in lab. It's actually, I'll tell you here and then I'll show you in lab. Okay, so we log on to Canvas. We take a nap. <laughs> we, we set our alarm for maybe 9.30 so we can check. If it doesn't come up, we hit the snooze button. <laughs> you can sleep before a little bit. You see, exactly. Okay. And then we, then, okay, we're, right, we're almost ready to go. All right. Yeah, it's thinking about it. All right, so here's the example that we went over the last time. And it's in a zip file. So I'm going to extract the zip file. Okay, so let's say you are done with your assignment. All right, and you have it in a folder. Let's say it's lab two. All right, all your files are in a folder. That's what we've done so far in this class. The assumption has been all, all your files are in the same folder. The CSS file, the HTML file, any images that you have are all in the same folder. We'll talk soon about what if they're not in the same folder, because sometimes you want to put them in different folders. But anyhow, we'll assume everything's in the same folder. You go and you find a folder, you write mouse on it, you say send to compressed zip folder. Click that, and that will create a zip file for you. And then the idea is, is the zip file looks like it's a folder, but it's not really a folder. It sort of smashes everything together into like one envelope, one file. And then you only need to send that one file. All right. To extract it, you double click on it and click extract. And then you can sort of unpack it, take all the files from within that, that one file and Pack it, uh, unpack them. To do it on a Mac is almost the same thing. You don't have a right mouse button, but you'd use the alt right, uh, mouse button, which is, I have to have it in my hands to do it, but you know what that is. The analogy to a right mouse button, control mouse, or something like that. Then there will be like compress files or something like that. And then you click that, and that'll zip it up. All right. So here's where we left off last time. Thank you. No problem. Can I ask one quick question? Yeah, about sure. Last week, where we were talking about copyright, yeah. if we wanted to try and get a copyright, uh, to get permission mm -hmm. on something that was copyrighted, how would we go about that? Well, you'd have to you'd have to know who held the copyright, okay. and um, 
if you had no other information, like the contact us on the website would probably be the place to start if there was a contact us. If you knew for sure who the photographer was, you could contact them. Like if you found it on Flickr, let's say for example, where, where different photo photographers have, you know, have posted their images, you could, you could contact you know, them through that. But the, you know, you'd have to take your best guess at who owns the copyright and then write them and ask them permission okay. and see what they would have to say. All right, so here's where we left off last time. We did a web page about Niagara Falls. I have no idea why I picked Niagara Falls. I know you were there a week ago, but I didn't know that when I did it, so I can't have anything to do with it. All right, so here's our web page, and it has an image on it. All right, let's look uh, at the image, the tags rather for the image. We open it up in Notepad++, you will see, here's the image tag. And the image tag is image, and it has two attributes. You have to say more than just you want an image, because an image of what? So you have to specify that I want the image src equals Niagara.jpg. Then we supply an alt attribute, which is used for accessibility. In other words, there's, there's a program or there are programs that actually narrate the web page to people that can't see, people that are blind. And uh, if you have an image, it at least reads the alt attribute to the person. So it gives them some information about what that image was. All right. So in this case, image src equals Niagara.jpg, alt equals picture of Niagara Falls. The image name has to be the exact name. In other words, this is on disk Niagara.jpg, .jpg, all right? Therefore, it would have to be Niagara.jpg here too. If you spelled it wrong and put jpeg here, then the image would not show. And you get the alt attribute written here. All right. At the very end of the day, I just uh, threw uh, the, the link on there, I think because we were running out of time. I probably would actually make that credit a link. And I probably put it in the footer. Credits are a, a good thing to put in the footer. Maybe put it in a paragraph. And say something like a href equals a really long URL. Then maybe have some text that you could click on, picture from Flickr, and then close the link tag. One thing I think a lot of people do when they begin, when they make a link, is they put in the start tag, but they forget that there needs to be something between the start tag and the end tag. There has to be some text that you click on for it to for it to work. Okay, so now this is probably a little bit better. Um, because it tells you that instead of a long, ugly URL. Again, we're still getting the alt text because we spelled the, the name of the image file wrong. Given it's in the same folder. We have to get the, we, we just need to put the name, but we need to get the name exactly correct. Okay, now what if you want the image a different size? Okay, you can size images through a couple ways. And, and what you're doing with the image sort of determines which way you're going to size it. You can actually edit the image to make it smaller. All right, 
or you can size it via CSS. If I'm usually just using an image on a page like this, I would probably resize it through a image editor. The thought being that if I resize it through CSS, I don't reduce the, 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 the byte size, how, how big it is in bytes of the image, the file size. So if this was a gigantic image, uh, if I resized it via CSS, even if I had it appear very tiny on the screen, it would still take up that many bytes that it was originally in download. Now, these days, internet connections are very fast, right, compared to how they were in the past. But there's it's always going to be a consideration in my mind how the, the size of your page, how many bytes are in your page. Because as speeds get faster, people put more and more content on web pages. And you're always going to be butting up against the issue of, well, what if you have a page that takes a long time to load? And of course, just because many internet connection speeds are very fast doesn't mean all of them are. There still could be a case of someone on a very slow connection. And for that reason, you would you'd want to limit the size of the file that you download. You also don't want to go crazy with images any more than you would want to go crazy with anything else on a web page. Colors, links, etc. You don't want overkill. Remember, when you're designing something, the more that you put on the page, the more potential there is for it to distract people from the really important stuff. So if I have a single image on this page of, of Niagara Falls, people are really going to pay attention to that. If I had 50 pay, uh, pictures on this page, each one of those pictures will have less of an impact. So be careful what you do. All right. This isn't the technical aspect of web development. This is the design aspect. Create the stuff in a way where you properly emphasize the stuff that you want to be emphasized. All right. So let's say we want to make this smaller. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go in to an editor. But before I do that, I'm going to make a copy of the original. Why do I make a copy of the original? Why did I say before I go and make changes to this file, make a copy of it? So that if you alter it in a way and you find that you really didn't like what you had done or you wanted to use the original for another purpose, you would have that option. Exactly. So you can always go back to the original. That's especially critical. I, I guess it's critical no matter what you're doing editing the, the picture. But it's very critical when you resize a picture. Because once you make a picture smaller, you can't make it bigger again without losing quality. And I'll demonstrate that. All right, I have my back up here. So let's go and edit this. And I'll edit it with Paint 3D, which is a very simple editing tool. Uh, it's on Windows systems. Um, older Windows systems had regular paint to it. So I'm going to go here and say, and I never remember how this works, because I'm used to the old paint. Uh, let's see. Anyone remember? Okay, there. No, that's not it. I'm going to close this guy and start over again. All right, 
once that crapping canvas. There we go. Resize canvas. Whew. Glad I could find that. So if I go and I make this small, and I can make it small a couple different ways. I can drag it to make it small, or I can put in the size I want it to be. So let's say I make it really small, and I save it. I look at my web page, wow, that image is tiny, all right? So I'm going to make it big again. If I did not have the original to go back to, I'd be stuck because I would go back to canvas. If I were to make it bigger, yeah, it doesn't look very good, it's very fuzzy. The reason for that is when you make it smaller, you're actually losing information. And when you make it bigger again, that information isn't there to make for a bigger picture. So the program sort of makes up what it thinks would be there. And it's not going to be right. All right. And what you often see, you don't really see in this case, but what you often see is, is things which were smooth lines in the original become like jagged lines in the new version. So would be in a mess without a copy of the original. So I'm going to copy the original back and okay we're now back to the original size and if I want to edit it again I'm going to go and edit it and I'm not going to make the mistake I did last time and make it too small. Now, notice here it says lock aspect ratio. What's an aspect ratio of an image? What does that mean? It keeps the length and the width in the same proportion to one another. Exactly. It takes, it takes the length and width in the same proportion. If you don't have that, you have the ability to either stretch out an image and make it look real thin or sort of flatten the image and make it squat. So I'm going to unclick this for a second. And if I go and do that, notice Niagara Falls looks very, very different. It's distorted. Or if I do this, neither of those look right. All right? So I want to be sure to lock the aspect ratio nearly all the time. I mean, I don't like to say every time because you might find a case that you don't want to do that for. But again, any time I can think of, you would want the uh, aspect ratio to be locked. So I'll make it a little bit smaller. And I can either put the, the values in here or I can uh, use the sliders. I can do it in terms of pixels or percent. So maybe I want to make it 50% height and width. And when I save it, notice the file size went from 56 KB to 9 KB. So it actually cut it even further than 50%. All right. Um, now if I look at it, okay, maybe that's the, the proper size that I have for this, okay? All right. Now, we mentioned that images can be used for a few reasons on a web page. Images can be used as content, right? Having this on your web page shows you sort of what Niagara Falls looks like. All right. So if you look at this, you can see, well, that's what Niagara Falls looks like. So rather than having a verbal explanation uh, that describes how tall Niagara Falls is and how much water goes over the edge, it's very difficult for people to, to, to comprehend, right? But if you have to have a picture, people can, can see it, right? So 
Images on a page can provide valuable content. You can also use them um, sort of to create the mood on a page. All right? So sometimes what you can do is you can use background images for your entire page. All right? So I'm going to create a second page. Actually, I'm going to create a second version of this page. I don't want to do that. And in this page, I'm going to get rid of that image. So I'm going to delete that image, edit it up, get rid of the image tag. Well, notice I forgot the end footer tag in there. I'm going to put Greek text in here to give more text. How do I get Greek text? You can Google Greek text. And you can generate some. I want one paragraph of Greek text. So I'm going to copy that and paste that into my page. Again, you would not do this on a finished web page, certainly. All right? But if you're designing a web page, let's say the Niagara Falls Tourist Bureau um, sponsored you to create a web page for them, and you were just doing some rough designs, you might not have all the articles that's going to be on the site about Niagara Falls. Maybe someone else is even going to write them. Right? Maybe, they've, maybe they employed you as a web developer, but they have a marketing department that's going to write up the articles that they want on the website. Fairly common thing, right? Well, that doesn't mean that you can't do anything until you get the, the text from the marketing department. You can sort of make some mock-ups of it, and you can use Greek text just as a placeholder. So now if we look at this, our page looks like that. All right? Pretty boring. All right. Let's go and let's style this a little bit. All right. We can actually make the entire page have a background image. All right. And we can do that a couple different ways. All right. I'm going to go and again, I'm going to do a search for Niagara Falls. Images. This is a nice big image. So is that one now. It's a lot of really big images that are pretty good. I'm going to take this one. I'm going to save the image as... BG for background. And I'm going to put copy the source of it so I can put it on the page.
while I'm here, I'm going to really make this, do this page up right. Okay, I'm going to put the header in. And I'm going to put in the article tag, because I have one article. Again, article section doesn't really matter. We could probably do that either way. Now, a back image belongs in CSS. So I'm going to repeat what I did last time, and I'm going to make a CSS file. So I'm going to say File, New. And I'm going to say the background, instead of saying the background blue or white or whatever, I'm going to say URL. And then within parentheses, I'm going to put, because everything's in the same folder, I'm going to put the file name. So I'm going to save this and style.css and then I'm going to link this page to that style sheet. Link rel equals style sheet. Type equals txt slash CSS. href equals, and I put the name of the style sheet, so style.css. So now when I view the page, I have a feeling we're going to have some good news and some bad news. All right? <laughs> Actually, we only have bad news. Let's take a look. Background. Body background. URL. Rel equals style sheet. Type equals text. All right, I had txt slash CSS, not text.css. All right, what would you say the good news of this scenario is? It worked, and it, lo and it looks pretty good, right? I mean, it looks nice. It looks nice uh, maybe until you try to read it. Actually, this doesn't look as bad as I thought it would. It doesn't look that bad. But in some cases, maybe with a different image, it would look bad, and it would look type, tough to read. Um, let's try to find a page to illustrate my point. Could you soften that page? Exactly. That's what we're going to get to. Is we're going to get to let's let's take this one. Which one do I want to do? Let's take. Let's take this one. So I'm going to save it in here. I don't want to do that. I'm going to save it in here and call it BG2. All right. Now I'm going to change my style sheet to use the second background image. Okay, that illustrates my point better. Lovely image. Can you read the text? No. What could we do to make the text readable? could change the color of it. 
So, this text is very dark on the top, so we could make it contrasting and put the color of the text to white. And that may or may not help, right? Probably will at least help some. And it does, except sort of through the fireworks it becomes a little hard to read because it's dark, but it's not uniformly dark. So a little bit of it is hard to read. All right? So what could we do to fix this? There's actually a bunch of ways that we could fix this. We could put it in a banner, right? So I could do this. change the color back, back to black, but actually let's get rid of the color. And I, let's see, what text do I want to look that way? I want the H1s and I want the header. Oh really I want everything in the body. So yeah, I'll do that. I'll say background, no. I want the background to be this image, but for the H1, comma, paragraph, in other words, for those two tags, I want the background to be white and the text to be black. Now I have that, which is not a bad solution, all right? We can actually make it a little cooler looking if the white background is a little bit see-through, all right? So let's see, let's Google CSS transparent background. And there's an opacity property that we can set. And an opacity of 50% is halfway see-through. So if I say the background's white, the text is black, and it's halfway see-through, I get that. And notice how you see the image sort of peeking through underneath. Now it's still a little hard to read, so maybe 50% is too low. So maybe I'll make it 80%. And that I would say is a little bit better. I can still sort of see the image underneath, so hey, that's a great image. We don't want to block it too much, right? But we can't have the text directly on top of the image. So we can put a background and then play with the opacity until it gets to be where we can read it. So that's one thing that we could do with a background image of a page. All right. Another thing we can do with a background of a page is sort of do a wallpaper. All right. Sort of do tiles. This is a nice image because it's big and it actually is of Niagara Falls. So it sort of gives the user some information about it. But if we just want something that's decorative, just something to make our page look nicer, we could go with a background that was just sort of like the tiles that you might put on your floor or tiles that you might put on a wall. Uh, tiles typically have a pattern that sort of connects together. So like if you were doing pan, uh, 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 tiles for like your back wall or something, the top look like this. All right. When you put that with other tiles, it's going to form a pattern.
of a bunch of circles. And so on. You can like that. So if I wanted a pattern, you can find a square that has sort of a repeating interlocking pattern. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to Google um, background tiles. First, I notice that this is hard to read, this link. Notice that even though I said everything in there is a different color and so on, even though that that's in a paragraph, actually it's not in a paragraph, but even if I said footer, It changes the background, but it doesn't change the color of the text. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say footer A. I want to have a, back, uh, a color of white. All right. That way the link shows up on it like that. Okay, the browser has default rules for links. So even if you change uh, the colors of other things, if you want to change the color of the link, you have to explicitly say, hey, I want the link to be this color. All right. Now, footer A is a different kind of selector that we've seen before, right, compared to, to before. All right. It's not one HTML tag, it's two HTML tags. And it's different than this one. There's not a comma in between. What's the comma in between mean? It means this tag and that tag get this style role. What do you suppose it means without a comma in between? An A tag within the footer. Exactly. So if I were to have a link here that's outside of the footer, still gets a default, because that is not within a footer. This is a link within the footer, though, therefore it gets that style rule. Remember, always say what gets a given style rule. And the first so many style rules we had were just really simple. They were a particular HTML tag gets this. But you can make it more involved so that you can hone in and style different tags within different parts of your page differently. And that's a very uh, good ability to have. All right. In this case, well, we want all the links to the footer to be white. But we don't necessarily want all the links everywhere on the page to be white. All right. Notice another thing I don't think I mentioned. The A tag, notice that when we view it, it's right next to the rest of the text. That is what's called an inline tag. There are two kinds of tags, block tags and inline tags. Block tags sort of stack on top of each other like blocks. So for example, the header is a block tag, right? Because underneath the head, outside of the header is the next section is on a different line. We don't see this stuff right next to it. It's on its own line. When things appear on their own line, they're block tags. So the header, the section, paragraphs, list items. Most of the tags that we've talked about actually in this class are block tags, which means they stack on top of each other. So far we've covered two tags that are not block tags, and those are the 
Those are called inline tags because they're right next to the next tag. And those are links and images. All right, let's make a third version of this. And we're going to do a back this one. So I'm going to copy version two. Rename it to version three. Here's a nice thing. Notice that the change I'm going to make, if I'm just changing the appearance, is just going to be in the CSS. And notice, because I've used an external file, if I had five pages in my Niagara Falls website, all five of them would change. So let's look up background CSS background tiles. And here's some examples of them. And we can pick this purely, um, it's not going to be like content, right? It's not going to um, actually give, um, it's not like going to be a picture of the uh, Niagara Falls where it's good. It's, it's more or less going to be decoration. So, I don't know. I suppose it doesn't matter which one we pick. He says as he scrolls through all of them, examining them. Let's pick the snowflakes. I hope this doesn't cause any of you to hate me. All right? But I actually like winter. Uh, you do? Yeah, I'm from Puerto Rico. I'm tired of the heat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I handled the heat a lot better when I was younger than I'm older. And, and I actually enjoy the cold weather. I took up cross-country skiing, and I like to get outside in the cold weather. I like to take pictures and all that. So I, when people were posting to Facebook, like, don't complain about the heat because we're going to get this in six months, and they showed pictures of blizzards, I was like, please, please. I should move up to my, with, with my daughter in Minnesota. All right, because they get like way more snow than we do. Like there were times last year where we would just get a dusting and she had like, like over a foot. So they get a lot more snow up there. Anyhow, I'm going to go and I'm going to copy this background. And I'm going to right mouse and say save image as. And I'm going to save it. in version 3. And I'll just leave the title as Snowflake Tile because that's a simple enough tile, uh, file name. So now I'm going to go here and instead of saying URL BG blah blah blah, I'm going to say Snowflake Tile dot JPEG. And notice what happens. the background sort of interlocks and it tiles over the page. Now, if we look at the image itself, the image is small. It's only this big. Yet the way that it is created, this guy over here lines up with this one. This one lines up with that one. And these four form a little, little snowflake. All right, so they sort of form, they form an interlocking pattern. Now, the advantage of this, of course, is this is going to be a really small file. This is only a 
26 KB, which is a tiny file. All right. Now, we have the background just on the body. We could put the background where we want. So, for example, I could put the background on the header section. And I get that background just on the header section if I wanted to do that. Because the picture is a tile and it's not like a really, really cool picture, all right, I don't mind covering it up. So I might change the opacity of this back to 0%. So it's not see through at all. And that was a mistake. Oh, background white. I get get rid of that. All right. Now it's kind of hard to read. I'm going to change color black. And I'm going to only put this in the H1. I'm going to change it to color white. All right. And, okay, that looks pretty good. Now, there's one more thing that we can do. All right, I'll, I'll take a minute going over time today so I can wrap this topic up. Is we can actually sort of, I think you said before, we can actually, like, lighten the image. All right? So, let's go to make another copy. And again, making other copies like this in a way is good, right? Because let's say I was doing this for Niagara Falls Tourist Bureau and I was developing their home page. I can actually show them which one do you like, you know? And I can do that without having to write four complete web pages from scratch, right? I've written one web page and I've applied three different style sheets to it or four different style sheets to it. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to edit the CSS file. And we'll put the background image back. And I'm going to get rid of all this stuff. That should be BG2. All right, we're back to the problem where oh, it should be body. We're back to the problem where we can't read it anymore. So what we could do is we could actually edit the image. Again, we want to make sure we have the original, right? So we'd make sure we had a copy somewhere. And I would go here and edit it and... Okay, this is changing the color of it. Let's do the brushes again. Thickness. Uh, I'm not sure how you do this in paint. I will open it up in another tool. There actually is a great tool called the GIMP, which is an open source version of Photoshop. It's like Photoshop, but it's free and you can download it. So I'm going to adjust this. And... I 
can choose a filter. I don't like any of that. I'm going to open with the new image manipulation program. This takes a minute to open. If you bear with me for a minute. saw the weirdest mushrooms on my way up here. I think there could be aliens landing in Illyria. So if that happens, you heard it from me first. OK, I can go here. This is, the, this is a tool I use most of the time and I'm most familiar with. So I can go to brightness and contrast. And I can really make the image a lot brighter. to where it almost becomes like a watermark. And I can decrease the contrast. So it's sort of a faded version of it. And I can go and save it, overwrite it, and I messed something up. I don't think I I changed it, but I don't think, I, I think I backed out. I, yeah, I hit cancel instead of that. There we go. And now, sort of a faded version of it underneath it. And you can play with that. And sometimes that's a good effect. All right. So I think I've talked to everything I want to about images, uh, why we use them. Sometimes it's just to make it look better. Sometimes it actually conveys some content. Sometimes it serves as branding or, or accentuating the mood of the page. We, and, and sometimes it's actual content. And then we talked a couple ways you can use them, either putting the images on the page or using background images, and a couple different varieties of background images. We're going to start talking about the project next week. All right, so that's what we're going to do. All right, we'll see you up in lab. Yeah. Well, not a background, just use images on your page. You could put them in the background or you could put an image tag on the page. Okay, because that's two different ways you could put an image. One is with the image tag and one was with the background. Yeah. Okay, sure. Contrast, color, contrast. Yeah, there, there's, yeah, there's any number of uh, tools that you can use to do that, absolutely. By no means is this meant, this was the one I use uh, is GIMP, but you know, you can use whatever works for you. Repeat that, please. Could you put one of those on campus? I'll put all of them on campus. <laughs> Repeat that, please. Aren't they all on YouTube? Yes. People sometimes have an issue with um, like being able to read the screen on YouTube, so I also post the examples.